I'm Alex Mosed. Welcome to Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle to fight back and win against big tech monopolies. We've got a great couple topics for today. Twitter and Elon is going to be uh, our first and very juicy discussion topic. We're also going to get to um, Etsy and, uh, and, a, and a producer strike that they're seeing and some other things. So, so let's jump in. You know, unfortunately, I was traveling last week, so we could not be in the studio and record commentary uh, and analysis of what's going on with this whole Twitter situation with Elon. Uh, Twitter is not a monopoly, by the way. Um, you can't just buy like 10% of a company if it's literally like a, an actual platform monopoly, right? You can't just go be like, well, I'm just going to go buy 10% of Google. Monopolies aren't worth, you know, 30, $40 billion market cap. It's not a monopoly. But I think now you're seeing how a platform which has done a grave injustice to the very ideal and value system of the platform business model, which is what? Which is to connect people and to enable the exchange of information and to uh, enable people to, to you know, spark their creativity, share information, create content. And the platform helps to connect uh, consumers and producers. Twitter, which began as the epitome of the platform business model, has now ended up many years later as a just sad, hollowed out uh, remnant of, of what a true platform business is supposed to do. They take these ultra aggressive censorship based uh, actions and then they kind of force the other tech monopolies that have, you know, real large influence like a Google and a Facebook, right? They kind of put them in a corner and say, well, oh, well, well, Twitter just banned these people of its platform. So Google and Facebook, well, are you guys supporting hate speech now? Are you guys hate speech platforms if you don't go and follow what Twitter's doing? So Twitter's like the crazy extremist that does all these radical things is the exact example of actually where Twitter and these other tech monopolies have gone wrong on censorship, right? You can have disagreeing opinions. You can voice things that people may not agree with, right? You can voice things, you know what? People might get rubbed the wrong way. You know what? It might hurt their feelings. But that's still called free speech. And Twitter and the other tech monopolies have gotten so far away from this. It's not even it's not even up for debate. It's not even a question, right? Like these are not free speech friendly platforms. It's not even a question. Elon polled the uh, Twitter audience. This is the Twitter audience, mind you. Um, he's got over 80 million followers on Twitter. He says free speech is essential to a functioning democracy. Do you believe Twitter rigorously adheres to this principle? 70% of the people said no out of over 2 million votes. So this is uh, him polling the echo chamber that is Twitter because Twitter has so aggressively banned so many from <laughs> using the platform, right? Like you're already speaking to a more narrowed audience uh, doing a poll like this on Twitter. Even with all of that, the results are overwhelmingly absolutely no, Twitter is not. Um, enabling and promoting free speech on its platform. Yet, like weird stuff. Right? I mean, I guess it's not weird. You know, you shouldn't expect uh, anything different from the mainstream media. But uh, like, look at this. This is within Ben Thompson's commentary. He's referencing from the a New York Times story. Mr. Musk, Mr. Dorsey, and Mr. Agrawal, who's who's the current CEO of Twitter after Dorsey left, believes in their collective beliefs in unfettered free speech. Mr. Musk has criticized Twitter for moderating its platform too restrictively and has said more speech should be allowed. Mr. Dorsey, too, grappled with the decision to boot former President Donald J. Trump off the service last year, saying he did not celebrate or feel pride in the move. Mr. Agrawal has said, which is a horrible decision, by the way, Mr. Agrawal, and more on that in a second, has said that uh, public conversation provides an inherent good for society. Their positions have increasingly become outliers in a global debate over free speech online as more people have questioned whether too much free speech has enabled the spread of misinformation and divisive content. And it's like the New York Times is actually trying to make Dorsey and Agarwal out as like defenders of free speech, right? Uh, their collective beliefs in unfettered free speech. They didn't like having to kick 
the sitting president of the of the United States off of their platform. But but, you know, they had to do it anyway. They didn't like having to ban Babylon B just a few weeks ago from their platform. But that was the right thing to do. Right. Um, and countless number of other examples that are not political, that could be religious in nature, could be about crypto. They've banned a bunch of crypto people off the platform. We've featured that on the show. They've censored people that are friendly to China, uh, that have opposing views on China. And then magically those people get banned or shadow banned or kicked off of Twitter. We've covered all of this, right? This isn't just a political thing. So Musk actually started buying shares in Twitter long before they kicked off the Babylon Bee, which was in late March. So he started buying end of January, really February. So February and March, over those course of those two months, he, you know, a uh, accrued a little less than 10% ownership in the company. Then there was all this rigmarole that they thought, oh, Musk is going to join the board and all this kind of stuff. Elon reached out to the CEO of Twitter in, let's call it mid-March, early mid-March, saying, hey, Parag, FYI, at that point, you know, I've bought roughly 5% of your company. How can we make this thing better? And, and to kind of be begin that dialogue, right? And wanted to discuss how to make Twitter better. Mr. Musk had ideas for reshaping social networks and improving, you know, the lack of free speech on the platform. So now, let's put ourselves in Parag's shoes. Richest guy in the world, platform savant, co-founder of PayPal, not to mention then Tesla and uh, SpaceX and others, but, you know, uh, PayPal being one of his earlier platform companies says, yeah, I'm buying into your company. You know, his stance on how he feels like you're way too censorship friendly on the platform and are going against, you know, the, the actual whole value prop of being a platform. What does Parag do? Does he, you know, tell his censorship cronies? Uh, his thought police, let's call them thought police to kind of, hey, hey, guys, like, let's, you know, let's let's lighten up a little bit. Um, you know, let's take the censorship back a little bit. No, no indication of that at all. If anything, right, we've seen since Elon reached out to Parag, Babylon B got locked out of their account uh, in late March and is still locked out as of today's video. Um, and. Them, amongst many other examples, right? Twitter's not changing its behavior. It's clear what Elon wants to solve. This isn't rocket science, right? This is, these are things that the platform is actively doing to, to thwart production on the platform, right? To restrict its content creators from creating content. It's limiting supply. Elon's had a bunch of ideas. Hey, we should open source the matchmaking algorithm, right? To kind of see, hey, um, are you shadow banning me? That's another classic thing. If you don't get locked out of Twitter, you'll just be shadow banned. Doesn't seem like Parag has really done anything. He's tried to get Elon to join the board, which was a complete nightmare how that was handled. Looks just very amateurish, right? Uh, he said, hey, yeah, we've appointed Elon to the board. And then it turns out like Elon was not joining the board. And if you followed him and you read his stuff, you watch his interviews, the guy cares deeply uh, about this country, democracy, um, the value system that this country was founded upon, uh, you know, just bettering the human race, rocket ship company, electric car company, against all odds, bankrupting himself 20 times over to do those things. The guy is here for the betterment of human, human society. And when he sees free speech being diluted and chastised and censored in the way that Twitter is doing it against their mission and value system, he's decided to take action. And it's a thing of beauty. The media cannot correctly and objectively state that Twitter has a free speech problem, which they do. So do Google and Facebook, but Twitter especially. And I think this is just a, you know, this is another sign of what we've been talking about for years now, which is a strategic blunder by these content platforms to be so censorship friendly 
That's why they've given rise to these alternative free speech oriented content platforms, whether it's, you know, Rumble and Odyssey uh, on the kind of YouTube video side, whether it's Gab, uh, Trump social media platform, um, and a few others on the, on the more kind of like social network type of platform. You're seeing these things prop up all over the place. Twitter is blinded to really, truly being able to look at themselves, look at listening to what Elon's saying, listening to the millions of people on Twitter that agree Twitter has a free speech problem. Has Parag come out and said, yeah, you know what? I've been listening to Elon now for a month. I've been talking for a month. Obviously, he kind of he knows who Elon is. I'm sure he's seen some of Elon's commentary even before Elon you know, owned almost 10% of this company. You read now and then Parag's letter, I guess, saying Elon did not join our board. I jumped the gun. He didn't say he jumped the gun, though, but he did. Right? Like, look at him, like, kind of subtly throw shade at Elon. The board and I had many discussions about Elon joining the board and with Elon directly. We were excited, were, to collaborate and clear about the risks. So they offered it. Parag announced it to the world, but never actually got Elon's actual acceptance. Amateur. Amateur. Who does that? Hey, the board voted. Hey, Elon had expressed interest, but like nothing is ever done until it's signed, sealed, and delivered, right? You can get a million verbals. You can do a bunch of edits on the contract, on the proposal. Not done until it's signed. Frankly, most people would even say it's not signed until the check clears, right? Until the wire hits your account. <laughs> this guy has not learned business 101. Bro, you offered him the seat. He said, yeah, I would be interested. Yeah, it'd be great to join your board. Great. Board votes. Board says, great. Let's invite Elon onto the board. Then they say, hey, Elon, we have appointed you to the board, right? Do you formally accept? Elon then said, no. <laughs> but Parag had jumped the gun, told the world, hey, we've appointed Elon to our board. Now he's trying to CYA. Oh, we talked to him a lot. He seemed really interested. We think he had a lot of value. Amateur. Then look at how he finishes this, right? No, no awareness, no recognition that they have a problem. There will be distractions ahead, which is obviously a jab at Elon, uh, you know, poking and prodding on what Twitter is doing. But our goals and priorities remain unchanged. Oh, so all those conversations where Elon's like, yo, bro, you kind of have a free speech problem. Like, you kind of need to fix this. Like, yo, I just spent billions of dollars buying into your company because I really think your business has a problem. And is like hurting society, right? But no, 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 don't worry, because Parag is saying, rest assured, our goals and priorities remain unchanged because Twitter is infallible. We can do no wrong, right? We are Twitter. This guy is, a, is you know, uh, a Jack Dorsey fanboy, will do whatever Jack tells him to do. We talked for years how Jack had bred a horrible management team. Twitter's just got so much, so much bad inside of it. Um, I don't know how you clean it out, frankly. Elon's a busy guy. He cares deeply about these causes, clearly. I think he's dipping his toe into the Twitter water. He's kind of seeing, hey, will the management work with me, right? Are we going to do this the nice way or the hard way? I don't think the nice way is going to work, especially based upon Parag's response, how he's handled the past few weeks since talking to Elon in private, and then have, particularly his public communications have been abysmal. Um, and it looks like he's just doubling down on, on what Twitter has been doing and not admitting, first step is admitting, hey, we've got a free speech problem. No sign of that. And I don't, I don't know what it's, you know, what, like what else does Elon need to do to wake the guy up? You gotta shake him? You're like, hey, like, Wake up. I don't think it's going to work. He's been there for like almost 11 years. Why is Parag going to look at this and say, yeah, yeah, Twitter's got a bunch of problems. All the tools that he's built 
to enable the content censorship, right? It, like for him to say, yeah, you know what? You're right, Elon. Um, we got big problems. No, he's not going to do that. Parag has to go, and I don't think he goes nice. I think you got to take the gloves off. And it's going to get, it's going to require more money. I don't think Elon cares about the money. I think this is different. This isn't him making a financial investment. The guy's the richest guy in the world. He's not here to make money off of an investment in Twitter. What he is here to do is to fix the free speech problems. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. And if he loses money to do it, he'll lose money to do it. I would love for this to be handled amicably. I would love for Parag to come to his senses to kind of go on. Maybe he needs to go on another ayahuasca trip with Jack and they can go out into the, into the desert and they can say, does Twitter have a free speech problem? And then, you know, maybe they'll, they'll wake up and they'll say, yeah, you know, maybe we do. Maybe the richest guy in the world, one of the best entrepreneurs in our lifetime, maybe he has a point. Maybe his tens of millions of followers, maybe they actually agree with him. Like maybe there's a there there. Because right now I haven't seen that. What do you need more time to figure this out for? It's clearly an issue. Why would the guy spend billions of dollars? I agree with his approach. I'm not disagreeing with Elon's approach. You got to go in nice. Hey, let's work collaboratively. Twitter's going to give you the cold shoulder. Say, oh, we, yeah, we just got to stay focused. We got to remain unchanged. We got nothing to reassess here. And then, you know, the rubber will hit the road. And uh, if I'm a betting man, I'm definitely betting on the richest man in the world, like tech billionaire, platform savant genius. Yeah, I'm betting on that dude to win. Um, <laughs> rather than Parag and his, you know, holdover cronies of B grade, B, B grade, be generous. I'd probably give him like a C plus as a management team. Um, yeah, strong C plus. Oh, give him C plus, not a C, C plus. Yeah, Elon wins, 100%. Special edition t-shirts. You want one of these t-shirts, you can see the t-shirt. What's it say? Twitter is for commies. And yes, I had this t-shirt made long before Elon took a stake in the company because this statement has been true for a lot longer than Elon has been an owner in Twitter. If you want one of these t-shirts, text us at 203-646-5159. Text us Elon at 203-646-5159 and we will send you one of these t-shirts, which is, you know, just speaking truth. Etsy sellers are going on strike. The platform has raised its take rate, which is the fee that it takes from GMV. So, you know, you sell, you buy something for $100, that's GMV, uh, not revenue to the platform. The revenue to Etsy is the take rate that it charges from that $100 transaction, which historically had been about 5%. So. $100 purchase on Etsy, Etsy gets $5 in revenue. Um, that was actually, a few years ago, was actually at 3.5%. So a few years ago, Etsy went from 35 to 5% take rate. And now just recently, they've announced they're going to go up to 6.5%. This is a great example of what we've talked about with Etsy's rise is, is really going from one platform to a dominant platform in its space to then platform conglomerate. You're seeing Etsy's evolution where they, they've now made a couple acquisitions, one in Europe, one in South America, um, some in a related business model to Etsy, so just kind of geographic expansion, some going into, for example, the Depop acquisition is really bringing Etsy into the secondhand clothing market, which is a great market for them to get into. Love that. Uh, Love that positioning. They're bringing Depop to the US and then they can use Depop as a foothold in Europe to kind of bring the more traditional Etsy model to Europe. So you see Etsy flexing its, its muscles and its strength into these new markets, new geographies, new business models. And then you see them saying, well, you know, we're creating so much value. And we have so many sellers now. They have over 5 million sellers on the platform. Well, we think we've got more leverage, we being the platform. So when we have more leverage as the platform, how do you make more money? The answer is taking it from your sellers, your producers. And that is the classic thing that 
uh, regulators and legislators in the U.S. and globally have completely missed about the platform business model is when the platform business model gains in strength, when the platform kind of rises on its monopolistic ascension to dominance, where does it take that extra pound of flesh to beef up its margin? It's not from the consumer. And they're not actually generally making money from the consumer. It's from the producer. That's where they take their pound of flesh. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're a Google, Facebook, et cetera, you're taking, you know, many tens of pounds of flesh. Etsy's taking a pound of flesh here. They went from three to 5% take rate a few years ago. Now they're going from five to six and a half. They did another rule change actually right before COVID um, where they were saying, hey, you know, we want to be able to advertise your products on Google. And if we advertise your products on Google, you, the seller, have to pay us at least 12 and a half percent, right? Because because they're saying, hey, well, we're going to spend money advertising you on Google. So if we do that, then then we need to make sure we get at least 12 and a half percent on on the sale of that product without the seller being able to opt out of that program. Right. So there are instances where Etsy is actually taking, you know, even more than 10 percent take rate in those kinds of models. Right. So now Etsy can go to Google and say, hey, you know, if my spread is seven and a half percent right from. Whatever I pay on advertising. As long as seven and a half percent of that GMV is less than what Etsy is spending on Google or Facebook ads, they just made positive margin, right? So they're doing things like that. This is an example of Etsy gaining dominance, gaining power, gaining you know more strength, and the sellers aren't happy about it. Uh, they've got fourteen thousand sellers are on strike for uh for a week or so here a lot of these sellers have been around for a long time and so they can see the gradual climb and um, extraction of more fees from the sellers now is this justified right um, or is this just a, a mechanism for the platform to pad its margins so etsy says the new fee structure will enable us to increase our investments um, including marketing, okay, customer support, and removing listings that don't meet our policies. So I think this last bullet, the sellers would absolutely agree. They don't like having kind of like bogus Etsy sellers, right? That aren't actually making crafts, homemade goods, but they're they're just kind of resellers. They're buying stuff that's mass manufactured. Might seem like it's a craft, homemade good, but it's not, right? So. How can you crack down on these kinds of, you know, fake sellers, right? Um, it could be a real product, but it's just, it's not in keeping with the Etsy community of, of what, you know, it's supposed to be about. Sellers and Etsy are in agreement there. Let's crack down on those people. Customer support. The sellers are saying, yeah, the Etsy has an infamously slow support system. They have a bunch of AI bots taking down stores, you know, inappropriately saying, hey, you violated a rule. And then but there's no human you can talk to uh, to work through that problem with. Right. So but here's the crazy thing. I was reading up on this. The CEO, Josh Silverman, said Etsy is working on making an app for sellers to help them more easily manage their businesses. They haven't made an app for their sellers. How is that possible? You have to go into the web portal every time or log into a mobile website every time you want to make edits. On your Etsy store, or like maybe they would text you, hey, you got an order. Like, there's no app for the sellers. That seems insane to me. You don't need to raise your take rate to make an app for the sellers, guys. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, you have over 5 million sellers. There's no app. I mean, that seems insane. The marketing thing, I don't think jives with the sellers. What I'm not seeing here is where is the fulfillment and infrastructure support, right? I think that. Is, is such a big challenge. How can Etsy get better at payments, shipping, fulfillment, these kinds of things, right? I think that's one of the biggest challenges for if you want to buy a lot of stuff on Etsy, you're paying separate shipping fees for each one of these sellers and it can vary. The fulfillment times can vary, right? Like how can you help solve those problems? I feel like if if you were to really talk about what you're doing there, in addition to customer support and taking down these, you know, inappropriate sellers, I mean, that kind of seems table stakes, right? And you're really investing in infrastructure and fulfillment and, and those kinds of value added services. 
That would make sense. But the first thing they led with, this is Etsy leading with it, is marketing. That's not what these sellers are complaining about, rightly so. This is marketing is, that's making more money for Etsy. Is it really going to move the needle for these, you know, 14,000 sellers? Uh, I don't know. So I see where the sellers are coming from. What do you do? You know, you now have a, you have a, the ascent, the, a rising platform on the rise, flexing its muscles. What do you do? What can you do? The good news is there is competition in this space. Uh, we've talked about, you know, where is eBay? What is eBay doing? eBay, you know, is eBay's platform shrinking? Um, you can go check out those videos. But, you know, this to me, for just from a media standpoint, this article just came out yesterday. Where is eBay's PR people? Where is eBay saying, hey, Etsy sellers, we're going to give you a golden deal, right? We're, we're, we're going to slash our take rate for, you know, two years, three years, uh, which is actually a strategy which Alibaba used against eBay in China to beat eBay. They said, hey, we're not going to charge any fees for three years. And then Alibaba allowed buyers and sellers to communicate freely because there wasn't any concern about the platform uh, taking a, you know, a fee, a take rate, right? I wonder if eBay could, could take a lesson out of its own failures in China and actually go to Etsy and, 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 and try and recruit their sellers to say, hey, come over to us, right? Why is eBay letting itself, why is eBay allowing like an Etsy to exist, right? You would think there's just so much similarity in the business model. Yet, no, look at Etsy surging these past few years and, um, and eBay, frankly, struggling. Farfetch, luxury, good platform, public company, got about a five and a half billion dollar market cap, has announced that it's making a strategic minority investment into brick and mortar retailers called the Neiman Marcus Group. They're putting $200 million into this company. Obviously, COVID, you know, took the legs out of so many retailers that, you know, uh, just, just weren't able to make it through with, with lack of e-commerce capability and, you know, how heavy hit all the stores were in, in this period of time. The cycle has completed itself now. It's been 20 plus years. The marketplaces have risen to such a place of dominance in retail e-commerce, right, that they are taking positions in the retailers as opposed to the retailers taking positions into the tech companies, right? It's, it's, it's backwards. It, the paradigm, you know, it's now flipped. And I think it's really interesting because what they're also doing is saying that uh, part of this, part of the reason why... Uh, Farfetch is doing this is because Neiman Marcus is going to be a customer of this new offering called the Farfetch Platform Solutions. If you think back into the roughly 20 years ago, Amazon was kind of doing like e-commerce, but then it was it was actually powering um, a lot of software and tools for these retailers. That's actually what Amazon was doing like within maybe the first handful of years that it was around. And then it was operating inside of these retailers and it saw such a big opportunity to do marketplace. And then they, they essentially kind of took those learnings, took the, the money, right? Those retailers were the only thing keeping Amazon alive back in the early days. That's the only reason Amazon made it through. They being paid by the retailers and then getting all these really valuable insights. Then they did Marketplace and kind of the rest is history. So it's interesting now as you see Marketplace in the luxury segment here with Farfetch as one of the leaders, putting $200 million into the retailer, using this as a kind of foundational case study to say, hey, we're gonna take all the tools that we've built at Farfetch to power our own marketplace. And we're now going to bring those into replatforming. They're saying the, the Bergdorf Goodman website and mobile app. And obviously the reason they're doing this is because they're gonna launch this as a service, right? And they're gonna try and bring this to other brands and retailers and say, hey, let Farfetch power uh, your digital presence. And hey, look, if Bergdorf Goodman doing it, right? If you don't know what Bergdorf is, it's one of the iconic retail entities like right on Fifth Avenue for, for decades uh, in New York City, right? So, but they went under like so many other retailers did. And, and so now they're back uh, with a fat check from Farfetch 
digital enablement from Farfetch. Obviously, there's going to be some nice ways that the Farfetch marketplace and the Bergdorf uh, Neiman Marcus kind of retail or retail and and digital experiences interact and commingle. It's just a really interesting play. Our partnership with Neiman Marcus Group is another example of how the Farfetch uh, platform solutions, right? It's, it's actually, they've got it as its own entity, got its own presence on LinkedIn, right? It's actually kind of like their, their tech spinoff uh, unit here. Farfetch Platform Solutions has become a preeminent digital partner for the luxury fashion industry. Another area that we've seen marketplaces help digitize these industries uh, during the time of COVID was the trade shows. So, you know, a lot of these trade shows where it's the B2B experience where you're bringing brands and the retailers together to, you know, buy and sell and look at, you know, the new fashion lines and all this. Um, you've seen marketplaces move into that space and help kind of digitize um, those kind of trade show environments. So you've, you've just seen marketplaces kind of penetrate up and down the supply chain as it relates to the commerce and exchange of, of these goods. Still though, you know, look at overall e-commerce penetration versus total retail sales in the US, still a long way to go for e-commerce versus overall sales out of a retail store. I would imagine the other thing here, which is not as much being talked about, is the fulfillment. Now, maybe that's not in phase one, but if not only you can solve the kind of digital customer experience for these brands, but then you can help them solve from a fulfillment standpoint, those are the two big areas, right? How do you fulfill orders at scale? In this case, what Bergdorf is, is to, you know, particularly talking about the international clientele. Obviously, Farfetch has very strong fulfillment capabilities. And so I think it's not as much talked about in this press release, but I would imagine maybe that's a fast follow. But those you solve those two dynamics for luxury fashion retailers and that's a that's a big win. So at the end of the day, it's better than Amazon rolling out their Amazon luxury thing and just laying waste to everyone as as they do in the Amazon way. So love seeing again up and coming platforms working with the traditional players and and bringing both of those sides of the world together to do what to fight back against the big bad tech monopolies. So this is a great example. That's it for us today on Winner Take All. Hope you enjoyed these videos. Don't forget to subscribe to us here on YouTube, but also join us on Gap.